Herbie, that's where you are. I've been looking for you everywhere. Oh, really, Kay? Where have you been looking? I've been looking everywhere for you because we've got this presentation to do. Oh, hey, Gowan team. Hey, Gowan legends. Hey, this is the K-Man, and this is Mr. Herbie. Herbie's going to help me chat to you about how to evaluate the effectiveness and safety of exercises. But first, I have to congratulate you because for you to be watching this means that you are committed to your ongoing education. You're watching this because you want to learn all about exercises and safety and their effectiveness, or you want to learn more, or you want to understand what you already know. Whichever one it is, congratulations, you're here with me and Herbie, and we're going to take you through a whole series of presentations, just nice and short ones, you can listen to them quickly, on uh, how you can look at any exercise that comes into the profession, and they come fast and furious, don't they have you? Oh, look, okay, man. Yes, they come fast and furious. Everyone's got a new idea, the new exercise, a new program, the new pieces of equipment. And half the time, what I find is that fitness, fitness professionals, what they do is they become experts in other people's opinions. They don't actually have their own opinion. Why? Well, let me go through that. And partially because they don't understand how to evaluate an exercise. What they do is memorize, 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 uh, outcomes or benefits that are being given to them and they go okay if that exercise must do that but they don't truly understand it so let's go through a nice process that you could use that will keep the emotion out of it because people do tend to get a bit of emotional about their exercise I've got to do my bicep because they make me bloody huge and if you question it they go oh, they jump at you or try to fix you but it would be great to you know, have a good third place, what I call a third place logical approach to evaluate exercises and whether they are good for somebody or maybe not so good in the short term or the long term. So are we ready to go, Herbie? Okay, go okay, Fantastic, where's my whiteboard marker? Oh, there you go, you're looking at it right in the supraspinous fossa. Yes, that's where I always keep the uh, whiteboard marker, right here where the supraspinatus sits in the supraspinous fossa. It sits beautifully in there, doesn't it, Herbie? Thank you so much for helping me. Oh, it's okay, Cameron. Okay, Okay, so I'm going to give you a five-step approach, and I'll briefly explain each one, and as we go through future exercise evaluations, I'll go into more depth, which will help to give you a deeper understanding and a, a method, uh, an approach, a systematic way to look at exercises. So when you come across any exercise, whether it be a, a common one such as bench press, and sometimes it's good to question your knowledge you already have before we start to question the knowledge that you don't have. So what I find is what a good thing to do is start to look at what you already know and start questioning it and start to seek to understand it. Because what, what a lot of people tend to do, they try to defend their knowledge. They're so defending the knowledge they have, they're never learning the knowledge that they don't have. And they never really fully understand whether the knowledge they have is the right knowledge. It could just be, they could just be very emotionally and attached to the wrong information. So let's go through the approach. So the first thing you have to do when you look at any exercise is number one is, what is the goal of the exercise to the person who's actually doing it? Are they doing the exercise because they want to put on muscle or because they want to tone up or they want to burn fat or get striations in the deltoids? So you've got to first of all find out what the goal is before you start deciding whether an exercise is good or not. Because not one exercise serves all purposes. You, you can't have an exercise that works in all three energy systems or an exercise that activates all the uh, types of muscle fibres. So therefore you gotta look at what is the goal? Is it to burn fat or to build muscle, to get stronger, to get more powerful, to get striations or whatever it might be, get the fat off my tummy? Think of what is the goal? Why is the person doing it? Are they trying to get fat off the tummy? Are they trying to build muscle in the tummy? Or the abdominals? Or are they trying to build deltoids? Are they trying to trim them? Whatever it might be. So number one, because if you don't know that, all the other, other questions are gonna be uh, a little bit questionable, if you can say. The, the, the second one, is the, the golden rule of being a fitness professional. And what's the golden rule, Herbie? Oh, never hurt your client, Kevin. Yes, that's right, Herbie. Never hurt your client. Number one rule, your client does not come to you and say, hey, Mr. Fitness Professional, please, can you hurt me? Can you give me a bit of patellofemoral pain syndrome or a bit of impingement and tendonitis in the supraspinatus and the shoulder joint? Please, can you give me a bit of yeah, medial epigonal, uh, epigonalitis or a bit of golfer's elbow? No, they're, they don't, they're not here to get injured. They're here to improve their quality of life, 
and to be able to uh, meet the needs of their life. Yeah, there's going to be some extreme examples where someone doesn't really care too much about their safety because they just want to get huge to win Mr. 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 A or Mr. O or Mr. B, Mr. whatever who they want to be Mr. of. So short term, they're not too concerned about their health. They do all sorts of crazy stuff to win the title. Uh, unfortunately, down the track, they may pay the consequences. But that's their educated choice. So the second one is safety. Is the exercise safe? Now what I tend to do when I look at any exercise, I, appro I approach every exercise as the inside out rather than the outside in. What I do, Herbie, is I get my x-ray vision glasses and I look at the exercise and the first thing I see, what most people see is muscles first. They look at muscles now. What, they, what is that exercise working? It's working the muscles. No, 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 no. Don't look at the muscles. Look at what's underneath the muscles. Because if you look at the most injuries that people have as they get more mature and motivated, most of the injuries they have are associated with the bones, the joints and the cartilages. They'll get osteoporosis or osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or osteitis or periosteitis or capsulitis. They'll get bursitis, they'll get tendonitis. They'll get you know, all these itises all through, but the most will be the, the bones and the joints. So when I look at an exercise, the first thing I say is, or ask is, what's it doing to the cartilage, what's it doing to the bone, what's it doing to the joints, what's it doing to the meniscus, what's it doing to the uh, capsule, what's it doing to the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the bones and all the surrounding articular surfaces, what's it doing to that? Then I'll go to the tendons and then the last thing I look at is the muscles. A lot, of, a lot of fitness professionals, they look at the muscles and ignore the rest. So yes, that's working the bias, go and do it. It's great for the bias, but what they don't understand, it might be working the muscle, but compromising the joint. And the challenge with a lot of this, the safety challenges, you, you don't get a lot of these wear and tear injuries until way down the track. You get away down in your 40s and 50s, and the injuries that you, you have then, as I have, I have lots of injuries all over me, but most of those injuries come from the old bodybuilding days and the sporting days. I used to do all these crazy high volume types of exercise routines. But what I was doing was wearing out the joints. I was wearing a team. There's no need to do that much. A lot of the exercise were, I can just say, potentially dangerous in the long term. So safety is a big one, but look at the exercise, put your x-ray vision glasses on, and look at, you feel a bit naked, don't you, Herbie? Oh, no, no, man. Yeah, look at all the bones and what's it doing to the bones and the joints and the ligaments. And then work your way out. If it challenges the joints or the health or the integrity of the joint or the tendons or the ligaments or the cartilage or the meniscus or whatever it might be, then it's not an exercise worthwhile doing because you're only going to get long-term damage. What you're doing is you're accelerating the wear and tear of these joints which are wearing out with age anyway. So why put an accelerant onto it by doing an exercise that may build the muscle but it's compromising the joint. So I always look at exercises that develop the muscles, if that's what your target is, and protects the joint. Not develop the muscle while compromising the joint. So look after your joints. Because as you know, as you know by training lots of the mature motivated, most of the limitations are articular challenges that they have. So safety, here's a couple of things to look at from safety. Number one is what position does the exercise put the joints in and is it a compromising position? For example, if I'm doing a behind the head shoulder press, I'm putting the shoulder joint into abduction, lateral rotation, which is a very unstable position because if I want to dislocate your shoulder joint, then that would be the position to dislocate it. So any exercises that put your shoulder joint in this unstable position, it might be shoulder presses or wide grip lat pull downs or chin ups or something up here, you gotta to start to say, well that's a compromising position for the shoulder joint. I learned that the hard way by partially all dislocating a subluxation of one of my Olympic athletes uh, back in the 90s, uh, before the 90s actually, it was for the 1990 Barcelona Olympics, and I was doing, getting him to do an exercise up here, he lost control of the weight and he partially dislocated his joint. And that, you know, put this horrific feeling through me because I thought I may have taken his Olympic dream away from him because of the exercise that I was doing. It started to re-evaluate -re all the exercises I was doing and saying, why am I doing that? What's that got to do with kayaking? Because he, he was an Olympic kayaker. It's got nothing to do with kayaking. And if anything, he's putting the shoulder in a compromising position. So maybe, or even if you go the opposite way, if you go past 90 degrees of shoulder abduction with medial, uh, medial rotation, you're putting your position, you're joining the classic position for impingement. Because what comes underneath the acromion process is your tendon, your supraspinatus, as you know from your training. 
When you take your shoulder to 90 degrees abduction, you impinge the tendon between the humerus and the acromion process. If you go above that, you really impinge it, and if you immediately rotate it, you put it directly underneath the acromion process, and that causes a beautiful position for shoulder impingement, or leading to tendonitis of the supraspinatus. So if you look at sports that put the shoulder in that position, kayaking, I was spending a lot of time mending kayakers' shoulders when I work with Major League Baseball with the pitchers, abduction, media rotation, leg spin bowling, a lot of sports involved that will start to have shoulder injuries. Swimming, you'll be freestyle, that's a funny stroke of mine, isn't it? Or butterfly, not so much the backstroke, because that's the opposite. So position is a major challenge, and the, so number one is position, and the second is directional, direction of load. So the body's been designed to withstand certain forces. What it does do really well is withstand compression forces, like a car tire, it's really good in compression forces, it won't wear out. Traction forces, where the joint gets pulled apart. So compression forces, like a, a bench press or a push up or a squat, the, the load's going through the joint. Or traction forces, like a, a seated row, where it pulls the joints apart. Like the tire in a car coming up, no challenge with the tread. So compression and traction forces are forces that the body's been designed and the joint's been designed by the structure to withstand quite effectively. The joint, the, the movement patterns or the lines of force that go through a joint could be the major challenge and they are what we call shearing forces. Where if my car tire skids across the road this way, if I go around a roundabout or do donuts, you know, I'm gonna wear out the tire because the force is going across the tread that wears it out. So any load that puts a load across the joint causes what we call a shearing force. So, you know, forward flexion with a, a load, that's sort of put shearing force through your lower back. It's front raises. Lat raises, even bicep curls, yeah, that's going to put shearing forces through your, uh, your elbow joint. Leg extensions, we'll talk about all of these later, but all those are got a long lever, loaded in the lever, and it's going across the joint rather than through the joint. So there's some just guidelines when you look at exercise. Is it putting the joint in a compromising position where it's unstable or a position where it may impinge on a tendon or overstretch the tendon across a joint such as the knee? And what is the, the line of load? Is the load designed, is the load going through the joint in a compression way or traction, which is okay, where all the muscles, the agonists and the antagonists and the stabilizers and the synergistic muscles can work cooperatively to keep the joint in, into alignment? Or does it put it across the joint where you tend to disengage uh, uh, the antagonist while you activate the agonist? Because the antagonist muscles there to help stabilize the joint. But when you do a single joint movement, what we call third class lever, <coughs> you will find that the antagonist gets disengaged, you activate, yeah, the muscles you're targeting, but you're compromising the joint because it's putting this shearing force through it. And if you add a bit of rotation on that, you know, such as a, a, a rotation on it, now you've got these rotational forces which could also accelerate the wearing process of the joint. So joints are going to wear out anywhere, understand that, but we don't want to be completely worn out by the time you're 40 or 50. We want them to start to maybe wear out through the natural aging process while maintaining, be, may, keeping fit, healthy and strong to your 80. You don't go and get some new car tires and spin around, spin around and round about and do donuts because they're going to wear out fairly quickly. The difference between tires and joints is you can always replace a tire. It's pretty hard to replace a joint. So safety is really important. Even if it gives short-term gain but long-term destruction <laughs> or compromise, then it's not worth, uh, worth the exercise. Number three is when you're looking at an exercise, is it functional? And you should have half explained that, uh, uh, answered that in the safety. Is it related to daily life activities? You know, if you look at life, we tend most, most of our life in the upright position. No, we're not supposed to sit. And this is the way we perform. We run, we jump, we squat, we walk, we lunge, whatever it might be. So if you look at an exercise, does it relate to daily life activities, like doing a crunch? What part of life do you lay in the ground and do this? Or even a plank for that matter. What part of life do you sit there like a goanna, standing in the sun, in that position. It's not really that functional. Uh, leg extensions, what part of life do you sit in a sitting position with a load at the end doing this, with a load? That's not really functional. So you find that the more functional exercises will tend to be the safest exercises and the most dysfunctional exercises will tend to be less safe. So the next question is, I want you to look at the movement function from two, two, two points of view, joint involvement and body position. 
So joint involvement, so if I'm doing a leg press, yes, you know, I have knee extension, ankle uh, plantar flexion and hip extension, yeah, so that's like a normal functional movement. But when you look at the leg press, I'm, I'm laying down, pushing up in the air. What part of life do you do that? If I try to apply that from a functional point of view, from a leg press point of view, really if I applied the leg press to life, it would be me doing a leg press like, like that. That's the leg press movement because your hips in this flex position. So a leg press, even though some of the joints are multi-joint movement that look a bit functional, but really the body position itself is not that functional. So try to pick exercises that are functional related to daily life activities or even um, maybe their sport. But you've got to be careful with the sports because some sporting movements are actually unsafe. And I won't get into that today, but I will in the future. The next one to ask is, what is the, is there a benefit to the exercise that relates to the goal? I mean, is the goal achieved? Is the person achieving what they want to achieve? So if I'm doing crunches, for example, and my goal is to burn fat off my tummy, does laying on the ground doing this, squishing your fat, burn fat off the tummy? Of course not, we know that. You know, all you're doing is squishing the fat and releasing the fat. So it's, there's no benefit. Is it, even if you want to build muscle, if you're just doing this, is it gonna build muscle doing hundreds of, of crunches? Of course not. So all you're really getting is this little localized lactic acid burn that pushes up against the nerve endings, creates this pain sensation that we misinterpret as exploding fat cells or building muscle. So if there's no benefit, why would you do it? Even though it might be safe or I suppose, it's not very functional. If you look at say a leg extension, for example, leg extension in the position, it's not very functional, but there is a benefit, it activates the quadriceps, but it's not really, uh, is, is, it's not really functional and it actually is quite unsafe for the knee joint. So you've got to ask yourself, is there a benefit? Is it delivering on its good? Is it, is it you know, is it delivering the, the dollar, the bang for the dollar, or the dollar for the bang, whatever that saying goes. You can make up your own sayings. Hey, hey. And the last one is, is there a better choice? So if I look at, say, leg extension, for example, is there a better exercise that activates more of the quadriceps? And the answer is yes. Squats or lunges or deadlifts is a better choice. If I'm doing crunches, for example, yeah, is there a better exercise activates the abdominals or all the abdominal exercise muscles in a more functional manner? Yes, there is. Maybe doing squats or lunges it does work that. So you always ask, is there a better use of someone's time? Why do a substandard exercise that may not be safe, may not be functional, may create a little bit of benefit, but there's a better choice and it doesn't even serve the goal to its best of its ability? So there's a nice little five step approach and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a whole series of exercises one by one and apply these five steps to strength training exercises, cardiovascular exercises, boxing exercises, any type of exercise and we're going to make a collection, a collection of exercises, evaluations on their effectiveness and safety using these five questions. And along the way I'll apply some anatomy, which would be a good little revision of anatomy for you. I'll use, look at safety from a joint, so we'll apply that. We'll look at function, benefit, and most of all, we're trying to get the best program to get the best result for the goal for the person. So stay tuned, and we're gonna come back with some individual exercise one at a time and apply these, the fantastic five. What do you reckon, Herbie? Herbie, I can't wait, Kevin. All right, Herbie, you ready? You ready to uh, go and do a bit of exercise? Okay, Kevin. Let's go. Come on. You should. You should. Oh yeah, you can't move because you get no muscles, have you? <laughs>